Thank you all for participating on this panel. This panel's um, a little bit about, about how do we exchange knowledge between the different areas of the world, I guess, that we're all in, um, and learn from each other. Um, and so it's an opportunity for us to learn how we do that better um, based on the experiences of our three panelists today. So I'm gonna ask each one of them um, to give a, a brief intro. Remember that bios are in the conference booklet. Um, so they'll give a brief intro, but also um, in their intro, saying a little bit about what bi-directional learning means to each of them. So who would like to start? Sarah, you have the mic, so I'll let you, s you should start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Oma Atieno Sara. Um, I am 27 years old, and I say this because um, I have uh, respect for a lot of you because I know you've been practicing uh, medicine and in the global health, global mental health space for a lot, uh, for the time that I have been alive. So, <laughs> um, so I am very appreciative of uh, being invited. I met the SASOP group um, in Tunisia, and uh, like uh, Dr. Barbara said in the previous. Um, in the previous panel, um, I have had very good mentorship. Um, I started um, working in mental health in my second year of medical school. So that is how I got here. Um, Career-wise, um, I think I usually describe myself as my best ability is uh, uh, contextualizing uh, African communities or communities in the global south for international NGOs who want to work um, in Africa, so that has informed a lot of what I do, especially in research. Um, my most previous, um, uh, my most previous appointment was as a, um, the lead researcher for um, Fair Trade. I don't know if you guys know Fair Trade. Um, we created a agenda strategy for Fair Trade. So if you guys take tea and coffee, um, then I made sure that a woman worker in Africa. Uh, was paid well for that tea or that coffee. Um, currently, I work as a medical doctor in Kenya. I also work with Dr. Wolthusen in my county in Kisumu. We focus on research. Our most recent work is on suicide policy and prevention. Um, I, I, um, I, ha I was also recently recruited um, to join the WHO as a suicide <coughs> consultant. So yeah, um, I think a lot can be said, but uh, uh, I am very happy to be here and to share my experiences. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um. <clears throat> thank you. Um, my name is Lukoya Tuoli. I'm a professor of psychiatry and the dean of the Medical College East Africa at uh, Daga Khan University. I'm also the deputy director of our Brain and Mind Institute. But more relevant to the topic today on bidirectional learning, um, I am a product of an institution that was founded on collaboration right from the beginning. The Moe University School of Medicine um, was founded, uh, that's where I, I did my undergraduate medical education, but it was founded uh, right from the beginning by a founding dean who engaged, I mean, he did a tour around the world to figure out what is the best way of training the doctor for the next generation, and ended up uh, collaborating with colleagues from Indiana University, but also from Europe uh, in uh, Lynn Shopping University and, and uh, Maastricht, as well as McMaster University in Canada. So right from the beginning, the curriculum was written with bi-directional learning written into it. And so a lot of the practices, which included student exchange, teacher exchange, uh, research collaborations were built into the curriculum right from the beginning. And as a result, um, when we graduated and got into medical education ourselves, we uh, do not know any other way of doing medical education, of doing research, without thinking globally, and thinking globally in a way that ensures that people learn on both ends. It's not a one-way uh, uh, learning or teaching experience. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rick Walthusen. Um, Christina rightly pointed out, I'm once again between you and your lunch. 
Um, we are sorry that this happens continuously, but hopefully you find the discussion equally satisfying for now. Um, I'm, I was born and raised in Germany. I did medical school in Germany. Um, I went to the United States for research initially, uh, and then I stayed uh, there to uh, study public policy, um, and then I stayed there to do specialty training in psychiatry, which I'm going to finish next June. Um, and then I'm going to move back. I'm currently in North Carolina at Duke University, uh, and I'm going to move back to Boston, where I lived for seven years before to, um, as an attending, as a consultant um, in psychiatry. And I will, um, basically, my three pillars are uh, clinical work, which is about 60% of my time, and then I do 20% medical education with residents and medical students, and then 20% policy and advocacy and research work. Um, I started working in Ghana in 2010, uh, so this has been some time. Um, I started working in Kenya in 2016. This has also been some time, and that's how Dr. Uma and I know each other. Um, and I've been working, initially my research was about imaging genetics, so a very different field, uh, which I still really admire, and I love neuroscience, but really what, what, um, what frustrated me a lot with Im neuroimaging and genetics was you know, that you are, it's really hard to translate this into meaningful change for, for people. And now I'm on the other side of the spectrum, the policy stuff, which I think has the potential to impact many people, uh, if done well. Um, and you know, I'm really interested in the idea of, uh, we, we called it bidirectional learning when, when, when I submitted the proposal. Uh, I, I, I'm very glad, by the way, that this was accepted, because I think that's a really important topic which, which we need to talk about more. Um, I think if, if, if I had a chance again to resubmit the proposal, I would call it mutual capacity building. I mean, that's, that's the, the other term which is used. I think we use uh, reciprocity learning. We use mutual capacity building. Um, and I've had uh, <coughs> some experiences with it within the American Psychiatric Association. Um, I, uh, I'm part of the International Psychiatry Caucus uh, with Dr. Henderson. Uh, we recently, as, as recent as, as of May, we had Anna Ordonis um, joining our meeting. She actually works with Christina at NIMH, uh, and she's equally passionate about the idea of mutual capacity building. And at the same time, there is a little bit of resistance, right, within the American Psychiatric Association um, about the idea of, like, what do we need to learn, right, um, from other countries. Um, there's like really the idea of like, well, there's so much to learn, right? Like when you look at the American healthcare system, the community mental healthcare system, um, since Kennedy actually envisioned the community mental health system, and a lot has been going wrong. And you know, we have issues about accessibility of equitable mental health care. And I think there's so much for us to learn from, from uh, low and middle income countries. But not in a sense, right, where we once again just extract the knowledge, like, right, it's not really like the, the idea of, like, colonialism, post-colonialism, if you just take the knowledge and say, okay, let's do it in the U.S., I mean, that's another way of extracting knowledge, right, and just, like, enriching us. But I think, like, really the idea is, like, how do we make this in a way that both partners on both sides, and this may be between, like, uh, countries on the African continent and the United States, or Germany in my case, or between Asian countries and the United States and Germany, that all partners benefit fit equally and that there's mutual uh, capacity building and I think we can talk a little bit more about how we have been doing this in our work as part of the panel and then obviously we want to engage with you guys as well. So Rick just set us up, he asked all the questions I was about to ask so I think we're all set. So um, the next question is about e each of you giving an example in your work, in your local context of thinking about bi-directional learning. Um, so, Sarah, if you'd like to, to lead us off. Um, and then also, we're going to spend about 10, 15 minutes on this, me asking a couple questions, but I'm hoping that we get the majority of the time questions from you all, so be thinking about your questions. Um, so, how we um, incorporate by directional learning in our local context. Um, I think our work is divided into like uh, different areas. There's policy, advocacy, there's training, um, there's government uh, engagement, there's uh, mental health financing and like different prongs. So um, in advocacy and policy, um, we have by directional learning, um, um, there's the policy and advocacy working group for the AGMHI, um, and we actually have like a mapping exercise for uh, civil society organizations working across Africa, and um, 
So this way we get to experience what the challenges, I think there's a, there's a form going around and we get to experience what the challenges are, what um, different um, organ civil society organizations and mental health organizations are doing uh, across Africa. So this is an opportunity for horizontal learning. And then um, there is also a still part of the policy and advocacy working group. Um, Dr. Will Tuzin and myself um, are part of a, of a team organizing. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a campaign by McLean Hospital and, uh, and Chiromo Hospital Group and, uh, and Kisumu County called the Mind Me Campaign. So um, we are organizing um, webinars, right, um, where um, we can have like horizontal learning between the US and Kenya and Kisumu so that we see what stigma looks like in the US and what stigma looks like in Kenya. So basically what I'm saying is um, I think uh, mental health is a, like the problem space is very common for different places across the world. So in situations like this where we, we can learn, uh, those in the US can learn something about stigma from Kenya, and those in Kenya can learn something about stigma from the US, it's a very good opportunity for, um, for bidirectional exchange. And usually because mostly information usually flows mostly uh, from high income countries to low income countries. So in scenarios like this where we have collaborations across uh, the high income countries and low and middle income countries, then it's always a great opportunity for, for us to change the narrative and have information flowing horizontally and not vertically, yeah. Thank you. Um, so as, as I said earlier, um, I'm, I'm a product of a system that recognized that firstly, you cannot um, produce a medical doctor by taking them into a medical school in one place and having them spend the entire period of education in that space and that they would come out and they'll be completely well equipped to serve uh, all sorts of populations, that it is necessary to expose the person to multiple settings so that they can have an idea about how the global health system is organized and where they fit in that system. And so at Mo University, uh, as far as education is concerned, there are opportunities for students from Kenya to spend time at a variety of U.S. institutions um, in order to understand how different the systems are. And in return, students from the US institutions also spend time in Kenya, uh, usually paired with their peers uh, who have already visited. And they do activities together, they attend ward rounds, and they go to the community together. Um, the same happens with faculty, that faculty get to spend time across uh, the ocean, and they develop common service initiatives, they develop common research initiatives, and are able to collaborate. There's a collaborative research management system or hub through which the research grants that are collaborative between Mo University and the other institutions are managed, um, and that helps to foster the collaboration. And that hub um, has representation from the institutions that are collaborating in order to try and ensure that there is a degree of uh, equity um, as, 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 as they work together. Um, the second, and an example of stuff that has grown out of these uh, relationships is um, an idea that is called reciprocal innovation that um, uh, is happening between Mo University and Indiana University. So uh, initiatives like you know care of premature newborns or very low birth weight newborns called kangaroo care, which uh, was innovated in uh, Africa, uh, where the idea was that because the incubators were not sufficient and there were many children needing the care, and sometimes the mothers could just put the babies on their abdomen and cover them and give them their own warmth. And this idea was transferred back to Indiana because Indiana also has low um, income settings or has uh, resource deprived settings within Indiana. And that care was also transferred there and, and, and as an example of something that, that, that um, has been learned. Um, Aga Khan University where I am now, we 
a couple of years ago entered into a collaborative relationship with the University of Michigan that is centered around data science. Now it might look like, uh, so data science is a very high income country thing, but the truth is that it is a, a lot more, it's, it's an innovation that is a lot more democratic if you have people who have the training than a lot of the innovations that uh, are done in high income countries. And the uh, key of bidirectionality in this relationship is that there are algorithms that have been developed in the US to track certain indicators and to make certain predictions about risk of suicide, risk of episodes of mental illness and so on. And we have been collecting data in Kenya um, with similar parameters. And so the intention is to develop algorithms in Kenya that make accurate predictions on the Kenyan population and then to compare the two algorithms, the one in the US and the one in Kenya, to see whether there are similarities, whether they function the same way, we expect that they don't, and then see whether putting that data together and developing a common algorithm would be a useful way of doing things that would then benefit the US because the US has many people from all over the world, from Africa and so on, and whether that would also benefit a site like, like Nairobi. So that is an example. The last example I will give is um, uh, in a large study that we carried out across multiple African countries. And this was also a product of collaboration between um, five institutions in four African countries and colleagues at the Broad Institute and Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, this is called NeuroGAP, uh, Neuropsychiatric Genetics of uh, African populations, we were working on the psychosis. And again, we were very thoughtful about the relationship because uh, truthfully, where Harvard is mentioned, uh, there, there are perceptions of bullying. I mean, you might think this is a huge institution is coming to extract something from Africa and go benefit in the US. So we were very thoughtful at the beginning thinking about how is it going to be equitable? And we will not start until we are all certain that it is equitable. We spend a lot of time uh, thinking about adding a capacity development component so that we raise our research staff and our students and, and, and research and investigators to the same level as the peers uh, in the US. And then only after that did we start negotiating individual agreements between our colleagues in the US and the individual institutions in Africa. And MOUs were crafted and every stage of the way we were mindful about our contribution and the contribution of colleagues from, from, from the US. And at any given point, we had many, many difficult conversations that uh, included, the team has very straight talking individuals and they ask very hard questions. Um, and our colleagues from Harvard were also very receptive to this and were also not averse to asking hard questions. And so that ensured that the relationship was a relationship of mutual respect. And through that relationship, we were able to collect uh, you know, data from about 43,000 people across the African continent, data that we have access to, our students have access to this data. And many of our students have led papers related to the data that we collected. So I think those are just the examples of how we can ensure directionality. Uh, the key message being that it doesn't come um, without effort. It doesn't come automatically just because we meet Dave and I and we say, let's do this, and then it will automatically be equitable, but that it has to be something that you are intentional about. It has to be something that you constantly think about every single decision you make, whether there's equity in that decision, whether it's benefiting both sides of the ocean, and whether it is building those that need to be built. Uh, I think that's the lesson I learned from this. Thank you. Yeah, I would just like echo what uh, Lukui said in terms of research. So one of the things that are really important to us when, for example, when I do research with Dr. Uma is the accessibility of data. Uh, like, you know, there um, oftentimes we get the idea of our colleagues in Ghana, Kenya, wherever are like glorified data collectors, right? Like once they are done, 
we have the data and then we publish without their contributions, but really like what we set up, the, the way we are gonna set up the data and set up the data is in a way that all of us can access it and there's an agreement of like what happens with the data and who can write papers. It's very clear that you know paper authorship is distributed according to contribution, not according to like where you're from. Um, everyone has access to the data and can use the data to, uh, to write um, scientific publications. Um, the other idea is really the idea of mentorship, which I think is cross-cutting between research and education. Um, so as part of, of, of grants, uh, we write our research we do, there's always like, we're always setting up um, mentorships between like, you know, people from the same specialty, like for example, a data uh, monitoring and evaluation person from Kenya is, is getting matched with someone from the US who has like knowledge. And so there's a, a very active exchange of ideas, uh, which goes both ways. Uh, and so there's like a lot of like learning where people can take um, stuff um, for their, um, you know, practice uh, from from both contexts, um, and I think the but I think one of the also interesting ideas is you know when we talk about um, and the query was talking about Indiana in North Carolina we have a similar issue where we have like we have hundred counties and about like forty of the counties don't have an adult psychiatrist right and sixty of the counties don't have an child and adolescent psychiatrist so we are thinking about ideas of task sharing task shifting step care collaborative care right. Um, collaborative care with religious leaders, um, but we're not just doing this in, in a conceptual framework, right, where we say, well, look, the studies from the Global South show this, but we actually actively invite our colleagues from Ghana and Kenya, right, to also come and to also see and to also help us understand and, and to give them credit, right, because, I mean, there's nothing worse than say, I, I've heard many talks in the U.S. where, like, the, the collaborative care model, right, is like, well, we did that, we designed that. Well, that's not entirely true, right? I mean, the collaborative care, the way you envision it, is maybe, like, U.S.-specific and you implemented it, but the idea of, like, community-based care has been going on elsewhere for so long. Let's acknowledge that part as well. Um, but I think what's really important is it is so hard for colleagues from the continent, for example, to come to the U.S. or to Germany like in, in my uh, 13 years that I've been working uh, in Ghana and Kenya, it is only for the last three years that we have a consistent flow of Ghanaians and Kenyans to Germany, and not just like from Germans to Ghana and Kenya. And the challenge was the funding one, right? And the challenge was the visa. Uh, people always get outright rejected if they wanted to come to, to Germany uh, for a visa application. And so we did apply for European funded uh, for European funds eventually uh, through a program which is called Erasmus Plus, which is a mobility program. Uh, Dr. Uma actually went to Germany through this program. Uh, some of like Angela colleagues uh, went to Germany through this program. And the, the idea of this program is really, you know, like um, to have Germans, Ghanaians, and Kenyans sit at the same table and work on the same issues, right? Like I know they look very different maybe in Ghana and Kenya and Germany, but the idea of the issue is the same. So let's like sit at the table and like benefit from each other's knowledge instead of like just, you know, sending Germans to Ghana and Kenya uh, or in, instead of just like extracting knowledge from, from Guineans and Kenyans. And so what the program really does is it allows us to bring Guineans and Kenyans to Germany each, each summer for eight weeks. And you know, th this is just like the start of, of, of the uh, collaboration, but like really after the program has ended, like the people keep on working together on projects. Um, but, but again, when people come, it's not so much, right? The Ghanaians sit in one corner and the Kenyans sit in one corner. I mean, it's nice to have both people from both countries anyway, because there's already so much learning happening between Ghana and Kenya, right? As I pointed out yesterday, like uh, there is the, about the suicide, right? Ghana just decriminalized suicide. Kenya's in the process of decriminalizing suicide. There's so much from each other to learn. But then there's also so much to learn from, you know, um, the Germans. Uh, there's so much to learn from the Ghanaians and the Kenyans. So they sit at the same table uh, for a couple of weeks each year and then they actually brainstorm as a team instead of like right, just extracting ideas and then taking it. So I think that's, this has really helped us to, to um, engage in mutual capacity building. Um, but yeah, the, the administrative barriers, the, the finances, the, the visas, the, the, these are real barriers, right? And so we have to creatively think how we can overcome some of them in order to enable mutual capacity building. Sorry, um, if I may just piggyback on what my um, fellow uh, panelists have said. Um, I think uh, Dr. Lukoye and Dr. Othuzen have talked about um, what uh, in training, what opportunities for bidirectional learning exist. And uh, I just wanted to speak as one of the 
recipients of this, um, say, grant. Uh, Dr. Walter Zen has mentioned I was able to go to Germany as one of the Erasmus Plus um, recipients. And as a recipient of, of these uh, programs, um, I just reiterate the importance of them in 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 the sense that what they do for uh, shifting perspectives for us in the global south as well as shifting perspectives of those in the global north. Those in Germany get to see what happens in Kenya and what happens in Ghana, and those of us in Kenya and Ghana get to see. Um, say best practices in the global north and how we can apply them to our own context. So again, I think it's a very good opportunity for bi-directional learning when you have like say capacity building programs for both, uh, for both people across the divide and across the ocean. So I really do agree with both Dr. Waltosen and Professor Twoli that um, if we can get say more funding, I know there are funders in here, if we can get more funding for, <laughs> I am Kenyan, so I'm always beginning. Um, if, if if we can have like more funding for these opportunities, then I think uh, it's, a, it's a very nice way to inspire change across the board, yes. If I may just give a last example about how I, 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 I in my medical education, undergraduate, I uh, spent about two months in uh, Indiana University School of Medicine. And the importance of this experience is uh, maybe twofold. One is that uh, in a good way, it shows how different health systems operate. Um, so yeah, by the time I was in IU, they had implemented an electronic health record system. It was a totally different way of doing things. They depended a lot more on you know, investigations, ultrasound, scans, and so on. We depended a lot more on physical examination and understanding patient history and so on. And so I saw that. But they also got an opportunity to have me uh, interview a patient and examine a patient and demonstrate physical examination skills and arrive at a diagnosis, a tentative diagnosis, without necessarily needing to have an ultrasound done or anything like that. So that, that was something that we benefited from. Uh, on the other side, so many young Africans uh, look at places in the global north uh, with rose-tinted glasses. People think that's heaven and I'm living in hell. Um, so I encountered my first uh, experience of, uh, I think, institutionalized racism in, in IU because uh, I lived with one of the students who was my classmate and she would take me in the morning to the hospital where I was doing rounds and then in the evening we'd go back together. So one day uh, she uh, was making a turn and there was a police car behind, coming from behind us and there was a, a bit of a collision. So she stopped and the police woman came uh, to us. We didn't leave the car and I was sitting on the passenger seat and she came, peeped into the car. The driver, my colleague, was in shock. She was paper white. She was like, what has happened? And she wasn't even talking. And the policewoman looked through and didn't speak to her. She came right to my side and asked for a picture ID. And this, this was my second week in the US. And I asked, what do you mean? What's a picture ID? I have no idea what a picture ID is. And she said, you don't speak to an officer like that. And so we started having a conversation with her. And then I said, but I'm, I feel like we need to pay a little bit more attention to this lady <laughs> because <laughs> well, she, she looks like she's in shock after this crash. Don't you think we should? She told me, no, you don't talk to an officer like that. I'm going to have to investigate you. Uh, where do you come from? And I said, I come from Kenya, and I'll be back in Kenya in a few weeks, so you don't need to worry about me. So she was really, really upset. But eventually, as we dealt with my colleague, and I was released, but then she made a follow-up call to the program director to confirm that I am who I said I was. Um, and I felt a little bit like that, that was not a uh, treatment that is normal. So I got an experience of the US. I had a patient who uh, refused to have me examine her because I'm a black student and insisted on my colleague who was white to examine her. And these are the experiences that we, I could pick up and see the iniquities right from the beginning mm -hmm. and be able to say, it's not all heaven. There are challenges in the US that need to be addressed in order to ensure equitable access to healthcare, uh, just as there are challenges in Kenya. 
that require to be addressed from a different lens. Thank you. And thanks for sharing those important points of the challenges in the US as well. Um, I'm gonna stop for and pause for a minute to see if anyone has questions. Great. Do we? I don't so much have a question, but, a, but an offer, really. <laughs> so my name is Alison Bentley. I'm chairperson of the South African Society for Sleep and Health. And we have a collaborative arrangement with AGMHI, as I'm, as I'm sure you know that if you're a member, then you're a member of our society as well. You may not have known that, but, but you are. Like, we subtly just took you all on board. Um, and I don't know whether this is bi-directional, but I'm hoping it is. So um, part of the society is education on sleep, obviously, so insomnia and sleep apnea and all of that kind of thing. And we do know that there's a great dearth of information and training for doctors on sleep medicine, certainly in the rest of Africa and even in South Africa. So there's no formal training in South Africa in any of the undergraduate programs on sleep medicine. Um, and so we have a clinic that we've now developed in Johannesburg, and it's, it has... It has some nice sponsorship from a mattress company. Apparently that's what I do, is get sponsorship from mattress companies. <laughs> so we have some sponsorship, and the idea really is to try and um, create training for, for doctors across the continent on, on sleep medicine. So the offer is if anyone wants training on sleep medicine, please let me know. The offer is also, the idea is also to do research on moving sleep medicine, which in our continent is a very elitist type of medicine. So if you don't have funding for a CPAP machine, there is no treatment for sleep apnea. Um, treatment for insomnia is very often medication-based, and the medication is not available in the public sector. So what the two big projects that we want to do, and the offer is if anyone wants to get involved in these projects, please let me know, because I cannot do them on my own, um, is to look at non-CPAP um, treatments for sleep apnea so that we can push it into public sector medicine and also to come up with a really community-based insomnia uh, management program that we can do for, for patients. Because honestly, patients can manage their own insomnia if they're given the information that they, that they need. So the education and the tools that they can do that. So it's an offer, really, of anyone in the room who's interested in sleep medicine, interested in becoming involved in sleep medicine, interested in, at some point, we need to create a Pan-African Sleep Society. I think we need to do that, although we need to figure out that acronym. So, so we, need to, we need to develop all of this kind of thing within Africa. And so I don't know what's bi-directional about it. I think it's bi-directional private practice medicine to public practice medicine. It's bi-directional. It's from South Africa to the rest of Africa. I'm sure we can get the US involved somehow. Um, I'm, that's, that's really just the offer, just so that you know that it's available. As a member of AGMHI and a member of the South African Sleep Society, there are six lectures by me, unfortunately, six lectures on the, on the, in the membership section on sleep apnea, and there'll be six lectures on insomnia going through there, which you are welcome to access for free. Well, 200 rand, no, for free, because you're already members. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for this this offer. And I just want to pick up like the, the one of the last sentences you said, right, uh, about what what is uh, bidirectional learning, right? And I think there, I think there's some there, there are misconceptions in this space, right? I mean, one when we think about bidirectional learning, we always think about obviously the flow from like high income countries to low income countries, or from low income countries to high income countries. And I think part of it is like coming from the way funding is set up. But it's barely the case that the same investigator has funding to do research in both settings. You know, it's barely the case that you get a grant where you can say, well, I want to study this issue in the US and as well as in, on, on, in Ghana or in Kenya, right? It's usually like you can study it in the US or you can study it in Kenya, but re really like both settings is, is very hard to do. But the other thing I think which is important when we think about mutual capacity building, it doesn't have to be between high income and low income countries, right? Like, as, as we mentioned before, and I think like there are beautiful examples. I think, you know, um, Boston Medical Center has this really beautiful residency program they are building with Liberia, right? And Sinead just published a paper about this, where they stress the idea of like, like intracontinental 
capacity building is equally important, right? Where you can send residents and fellows from Liberia to other countries on the continent where they can subspecialize, right? In sleep medicine, for example, in like addiction psychiatry, in child and adolescent psychiatry, you don't have to send your residents to the UK or to the US. You can do this within the continent. They're like really great, right? Anusha is here. Like if, if you center someone to learn about child and adolescent psychiatry, I mean, I think there is like so much potential on the continent and this is really what mutual capacity building is also about. We don't have to always like think about high versus like low in income countries in that context. I think the other misconception really is, you know, we often say, well, you know, people here on the continent that we do research, right, like with Dr. Uma, for example, we often hear, well, let's ask the local expert, right, like we from the US, like let's ask the local expert, Sarah. I mean, what puts me in the position to uh, assume that I'm the global expert doing research in Kenya, and I, I, I call Sarah a, a local expert, right? Like Sarah is equally a local and a global expert, and I'm a local and a global expert myself. And again, this is a paradigm shift which we see in global mental health, right? Where we say global, like local is global and global is local. But the idea to call someone like a local expert is like just wrong. Like mental health begins at our like doorsteps. And like what, what is your global is my local and what's my local is your global. So really this is like a common misperception we need to address. I, I, I mean, uh, Rick is absolutely right. <clears throat> um, my uh, university is working with, uh, at the moment with the University of Cape Town in child and adolescent psychiatry training. So we are sending some of our faculty to get training in child and adolescent psychiatry so that they can come and start a clinical fellowship in, in, in uh, Kenya because we don't have a fellowship. Uh, one of my other faculty spent time with Bonga, uh, did her PhD at UKZN. And now she's back, uh, studied addiction psychiatry. Um, another colleague we sent to Ibadan for child and adolescent psychiatry. So that is the kind of bi-directional learning that's going on. But more university and within that AMPATH uh, uh, collaboration started a program with a university in Tamale in northern Ghana, the University for Development uh, Studies, which has a medical school. Uh, but they also are pretty under-resourced, and they joined the consortium. But then the arrangement in there included having faculty from UDS spend time in Eldoret in, at Moe University uh, to gain skills that they would then find useful uh, in UDS. And in Kenya, uh, so in northern Ghana, snake bites uh, are a big deal, and, it's, and there's a lot of expertise on how to deal with the snake bites, not so much in Eldoret. So the people from Kenya would spend time in northern Ghana uh, learning about how to manage snake bites, while the people in UDS would come and get some specialty training in, in Eldoret. So that's, those are examples of things that are already going on and that can be built on as examples of uh, collaboration within country, countries in Africa. Uh, thanks. There, there's a question back there. Thank you. So it's actually a comment. Um, so one thing that we are seeing more and more is, uh, I mean, it's evident, the stratification of research and education, uh, both in the developed and in the developing world. So in the US, you have your Ivy League schools. Uh, Harvard would want to probably partner with Stanford for and Duke for whatever reasons. Similarly, in South Africa, UCT would work with Stellenbosch, would work with UKZN, and sort of end there. So I think we need to look at mechanisms to allow bi-directional learning within the country and bi-directional learning across the country. So it is important to connect historically disadvantaged institutions in South Africa, for example, with their equivalents, which is HBCUs in the US, because they share a context, they share a history, and they will probably be able to you know, tackle these issues uh, more direct and more, more, more effectively. So that's the comment I wanted to make. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, I just want, I've got a question for your panelists, uh, Michelle, maybe Lukoye, perhaps. And, and I think it's around, um, you know, AGMHI and how we, as South Africans who are potentially a little bit more um, privileged than other countries in terms of resources. Um, how do we get um, psychiatrists in this country to say 
that it will be beneficial for you working in Johannesburg, you know, in, or in Cape Town, where there's um, you know a little bit better resources than uh, than people that are in Burundi or Rwanda or you know other countries on the continent. Um, <clears throat> how do we? What kind? Of, so I, I'm trying trying to work out the kind of the messaging that we should be using for SASOP members, for South African psychiatrists, to say, how, to please get involved in HMHR because. The work that um, you'll learn, the work that you know you'll do through AGMHI might be beneficial to you to your work back in Cape Town. Um, so you know, similar to the global local center in Boston, um, and and I would imagine also maybe even you know Aga Khan is has got resources you know more than other institutions in Nairobi. Um, so maybe how does uh, how do you convince Aga Khan people to say? You know, let's let's go to Malawi and, and pull up the, our brothers and sisters in Malawi to try and and that will be beneficial for you back in in Nairobi um, in the ivory tower of, of Aga Khan Hospital, um, if I may. I, I, I hope I'm kind of making the sense by messaging question clear. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Um, Okay. I fixed it. It works. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I, I'll take the context of the Aga Khan University. So um, in recognition, indeed, of the fact that in certain areas we have more resources than other institutions in our region, um, we are required uh, by charter and by founding to demonstrate local impact. And so we have to demonstrate impact in East Africa. Uh, other than providing quality health services, we have to demonstrate impact and we have to do things that are relevant in the region. So this is required. And the last, the fourth pillar that we're required to demonstrate is access. Where access means we don't provide services that are out of reach of people who actually need them. And so putting all those together, um, we have had to look around and enter into agreements with other public universities in East Africa and uh, also beyond East Africa, just so that we can extend our impact. Um, in Rwanda, we are now working with UGHE, the University of Global Health Equity, and we are working on having an arrangement for student exchange. Faculty exchange is already going. We're working together on curriculum development and stuff like that. And we benefit because our faculty get expertise in those areas. Our faculty get to see a wider range of patients when they go to Rwanda and when they go to the public uh, institutions, even within Kenya. Uh, so we are able to demonstrate benefit uh, directly, uh, both for our faculty, but also for the institutions that we are collaborating with. So I think it is a case can be made uh, here in South Africa also that uh, South Africa has a very different context uh, if you compare with many other African countries in East Africa or West Africa. So the context is very, very different. Your perspectives are very, very different. And I think it would benefit a South African to spend some time uh, in a country, in, in, in an institution in East Africa for some time, or in West Africa, where the context, the history is very, very different. And uh, I think it would benefit a South African, especially in psychiatry, where we have to always be aware of contexts beyond our own locality uh, in order to be able to handle the problems of patients who come to us. So it would be beneficial. And in doing so, if you came to a hospital in Western Kenya and worked with a colleague there and provided services, our that hospital would benefit as well because we have very few psychiatrists in most of the countries in East Africa, Central Africa, and parts of West Africa. So it is mutually beneficial, in my view, to have a framework, whether through AGMHI or through the psychiatric societies, that allows colleagues uh, some mobility to spend some limited amounts of time uh, in the different settings. And as I said before, I have absolutely no problem if a South African decides that they want to move to Kenya and they're licensed and they start seeing patients there. I don't consider it a drain or anything like that. I think it's a benefit to psychiatry as a whole for us to have mechanisms that allow this to happen. 
Um, just to chip into the conversation, um, I know you asked about academic and medical practice, but um, from a civil society perspective, when Dr. Walthusen and myself started working in Kisumu um, in 2016, there was no, there was not much of a mental health ecosystem. So over the years, um, <coughs> I think we started with one NGO, Tinata Youth Organization, and then over the years, as the as the as the message about mental health started like percolating in the, into the community, then we had several other civil society organizations coming up. So the question was, how do you get everyone who is interested and in doing different things to get interested in like uh, working together and benefiting each other, even from across different regions and across different contexts? And uh, for me, the answer would be simple. Uh, in the reaching out if i think if you reach out and like professor luca said if you can prove that there's a mutual um uh, you can achieve mutual uh, mutual results at like mutual Yes, exactly. Mutual benefit. If you can reach out to people and prove that there's mutual benefit, like in all of you working together, even in different contexts, then I think you will find that people are actually willing to come together. So we started with probably one NGO, and uh, from the AGMHI mapping that we're doing now, I think that Kisumu County in Kenya has like a lot of NGOs, not uh, some of them don't just deal in mental health, but they've integrated mental health into their activities. So I think the the, the starting point is in reaching out to people, and uh, you would find that I think a lot of people are willing to work across their context. Yeah. Good morning. I'm sorry, I'm going to keep my comment quite brief because I think we're probably running out of time. I like the, the way this conversation is going because it's addressing power imbalance. I think yesterday we spoke power imbalance in the context of the clinician-patient relationship um, and, and how the patient is actually being brought on as a collaborator with the clinician. And today we're talking it it at a, at a broader scale. And so for me, that's quite exciting. Um, my contribution or my question um, is, is maybe around the potential role of the AGMHI in equipping um, African uh, collaborators with the global community um, and, and maybe perhaps directed or specific interventions that can equip collaborators who are from the continent to become, um, you know, more alert, as it were, in collaboration with, with the global community. Um, there was talk of, a, for instance, toolkit, advocacy toolkit and that sort of thing. Is that maybe an opportunity for the HMHI to develop some kind of directed and specific um, support for researchers, for even clinicians for that matter within the continent, um, to know how to interact with collaborators in a way that where the, the, the power uh, is, is the power imbalance is addressed and, and, and does not place the African collaborator on the back foot. Because I think, um, um, Dr. Atole, you, you talked very nicely about how you guys did that in the, in the um, was it mental, um, um, neuro gap? Yeah, neuro in, in neuro gap. Yeah. Um, are you able to sort of make the learnings from that process more readily available, uh, maybe potentially through HMHI? To, to African researchers and the like. Thank you. I know Bonga will have something to say about that um, and how AGMHI is positioning itself to be able to address exactly that, have a repository where you can have access to resources that can help in dealing with a multiplicity of factors. And just to help with that, I uh, will point out, so we, we've been thinking about this for a long time. Um, there are a series of publications that uh, my colleagues and I have put out that ultimately, if you look at them as a consistent body of knowledge, they start teasing out the important things you must do 
in order to have equitable collaborations that ensure benefit on both sides. Uh, we published a paper in 2015 on building comprehensive and sustainable health informatics institutions in developing countries, and it included collaboration with our partners in the north. And then when we started collaborating with uh, our colleagues from Boston, we also very thoughtfully you know, went through processes of iterations of thinking, and we published a couple of papers that described that process and described how to equitably collaborate, and that should be, can be part of the, so one of the papers was one that laid the ground in 2015 to say we need this data from Africa because the genetic database is largely European and North American. And how do we do this? So we have a few papers that were published last year about what should equity in global health research look like, and it enumerates the principles. Um, we also have um, a paper developing ethical and sustainable global health educational exchanges. This builds on the lessons from AMPATH. So from both AMPATH and Neurogap, the publications are there, and I think uh, it's useful for us to go through those. So there is a whole, there's a whole set of principles called the Melby principles, and they're described in the paper from AMPATH by somebody called Turisimi and, and, uh, and others. And it outlines uh, whether it is in uh, skill building, as far as cross-cultural and cultural sensitivity is concerned, whether it is the relationships themselves, and how do you keep those relationships going? Because sometimes we might say GMHI has brought UKZN and Aga Khan University together. Now, collaborate. It doesn't work like that. It works in meetings like this, having lunch, having dinner, having drinks, and agreeing we want to do something together. And from there, then, building the institutional partnerships upwards, rather than starting from the top. Uh, thinking about longitudinal sustainability. What resources do you need to build into the partnership in order to ensure it is sustainable? Because you might have all the best intentions uh, coming together, ensuring you learn from each other, but as you implement, you find that inevitably, because of how you are structured, how you are set up, you're benefiting more from this relationship than the other party. Um, there's a misconception around equality, and I think in these partnerships, you can't have equal partnerships. It is not equal partnerships, because one partner is disadvantaged already, and another one is advantaged. So we think about equitable partnerships. And in equitable partnerships, I place a heavier weight uh, in certain areas on the partner who has more resources to give more, and the one who needs more help to get more help. And you will find that uh, it's not unidirectional, even that, because uh, partners in the countries that have more money have deficiencies in other areas. And uh, those countries that have less money have advantages in certain other areas of how they deal with things. And so the learnings continue nevertheless. But if you look at the money itself, then the burden is on those that have more, to give more in that relationship, on the understanding that at the end, on the other side of the uh, balance sheet, you're both benefiting equally or equitably from this relationship. Thank you very much. So I Just think... Yep. You have one minute. Okay, yeah. I need less, <laughs> less than one minute. I'm going to uh, limit, but one minute. Go. Okay, go. Um, I think just to add what, uh, to what Lukoy said, I think, you know, a framework maybe to think about building more equitable partnerships, right, is like a, the, the three eyes, like individual, interpersonal, institutional. I think we talk a lot about institutional stuff, but even like interpersonal uh, connectivity and, and relations are so important. It, if each of us in the room, right, like picks out one other person, like they want to learn with, they want to mentor, right? I think you know there would be so much more exchange on the continent already, right? Like we have, I think, people here from eleven countries, like, or like, you know, wh why not start here in the room with like building partnerships, right? Like trying to connect with each other, uh, you know, when we try to get people to the U.S. again, this is a big challenge, unfortunately, right? But like. We are leveraging institutions and, and, and partnerships to actually get people the visa they need or get the funding they need, right? And so it's one person at a time. It's not addressing the systematic issues, but really like it starts with one person at a time and like the change of the narrative. So I think there's so much we can do on an interpersonal level and on an individual level as well. We don't have to wait for institutions to move because institutions are slow and bureaucratic usually, but we can do things right now here during lunch.
Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> Literally, guys. <laughs> I, I, I don't know when I don't know when to come between your lunch, uh, but I just wanted to add to something she had asked about um, uh, decolonization uh, of of like the mental health space. If I did, if I got the if I got the question right, and I just wanted to say that there's a huge conversation going on in the global health space about uh, power shifting and, and decolonizing. Um, global health, but the same can be applied to uh, mental health. But I know we have to go, and uh, I think my one takeaway reflection about uh, bidirectional learning opportunities comes from something that the WHO said. Um, and they say that when it comes to mental health, all countries are developing countries. We all have different mental health issues in our different contexts. Maybe even if the context is high income country, low income country, we all have different mental health issues. And so given that we are all developing countries in the context of mental health, then it definitely means that we all have something to learn from each other, mm -hmm. despite, the, despite the context or despite where we come from. So that was my one takeaway when it came to bi-directional learning. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for making that, that point. I think it's an important point. I wanna thank each of the panelists. Um, I also wanted to just, um, in, in summary, what I heard I think often is the intentionality um, over and over again, right? And the thoughtfulness that if you truly want to be equitable and think and thinking about who needs more resources, who doesn't need all the re you really have to constantly be thinking and talking with your collaborators and your partners. And so I think that came through in what each of you said and and some of what people were asking questions in the audience too. And to the last point about um, a couple people pointed out AGMHI's role in this, which is uh, fantastic that you're bringing that up over and over again. And I'm going to point you to the back of the conference booklet and the resource hub and becoming a member and that that's how we're gonna build those partnerships um, and within the continent, within countries, beyond the continent to further the collaboration and the learning um, with all of us right at the table. So thank you all.